Welcome out to another episode of It's All Been Checked Before. This time, Tin Man. Yeah, and we've got b- 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 bonus content. Bonus content. We're going to be discussing the book, Tin Wood Man, which we talk about in this episode about Tin Man. Speaking of a bonus, join us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash IABD. Become a Patreon member. You'll get all that bonus content. You can see us talking about it. See what we're wearing. Maybe uh, get some little BTS, a little BTS behind the scenes kind of stuff. That, that content you will not get in a regular show. But this time... This we're giving it away for free on this episode of It's All Been Trucked Before, Tin Man. Welcome out to another episode of It's All Been Trucked Before. Your regular hosts are here. This is Steven. And Keith. Jimmy Jerome. We are here to talk about the classic episode, Scarecrow. I mean, Tin Man. (laughs) First impressions. I think this one's one where I think it's less than the sum of its parts. I think there's a lot of parts I like, but overall, I didn't love it. It feels like a, a low to high middle episode when we, <laughs> when, we, when we go to a ranking at the end we low to low middle i guess we'll see yeah i, I thought there were some really good moments but my overall thing was just kind of like yeah i, I would i would agree i guess it, there were certainly parts that i really related to but when i look back i don't, I don't feel like i was blown away somehow even though i sh- should have been by certain things which is strange i'm with you guys just it wasn't my favorite episode there were a few good parts but I'm going to say low to low, low to middle, or low low middle. <laughs> I think it would have been ranked higher in another season, perhaps, but in a, such a strong season, especially mm-hmm. after a pretty strong run of episodes, yeah. it, it felt out of place. And we, mm-hmm. it, it felt almost like a season one episode, in my opinion. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That's a good assessment. So we start out the episode. They mentioned the hood again. Which they they've been mentioning the hood a lot lately. This uh, yeah, season, which I like because that was Raker's old ship. Uh-huh. But this time they don't just mention it. We get to see the hood. We get to see while well, we get to see Captain DeSoto. Michael Cavanaugh is Captain DeSoto. He's best known for The Haunting, the 1999 movie, Holes, that 2003 movie, The Enforcer, Collateral Damage. He did an arc on The Young and the Restless a few years back. He's got quite a few credits, but this is his, yeah, his only track, Captain Robert DeSoto, just this episode. Hmm. I liked him. I kind of wish we'd gotten more of him. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I was suspicious for some reason. Me too. I guess, I'm, I guess I'll, you know, we, we see so many of these things happen all the time. Yeah. This guy shows up. Is he telling the truth? Is he really just passing a message? But I'm, I'm kind of glad that they didn't do anything with that. It was just... I immediately, was there. Yeah. yeah, I immediately thought of something I said a couple weeks ago, which was whenever these Commodores and whatever show up, they're like, well, that's what you got to do. And I can do whatever I want because I'm a Commodore and Starfleet <laughs> said I could do it. And then they never questioned it. But this time, right, uh, Picard's like, or Riker, maybe both of them are like, this seems kind of weird that you're coming all the way out here. And then <laughs> I think, but I think the fact that it's a captain to captain kind of a thing and they, uh, they know each other. But initially I had the same feeling like, uh, this isn't going to be good news. And it really wasn't good news, but it wasn't terrible news. It wasn't. Well, I think we were supposed to go ahead and trust him and not think he's shady because Riker served under him and respects right. yeah. him. But he also felt completely unnecessary to the episode. I just hmm. remember the conspiracy episode. Remember when Picard had to go to the other planet? And all that, <laughs> that was all very similar to this. We could have had an Admiral's briefing or just a captain's log recap. We didn't need yeah. a new another captain. Then we meet Tam. Was his name Tam? Yeah. Uh, Tam Albrin. Right. And he's played by Harry Groner, who I hope everybody recognizes. Best known for Patch Adams, uh, the mayor and the and early my background. Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Ah. Road, Road to Perdition. Right. I mean, even in recent years, he's guest starred in Modern Family, Young Sheldon. You know, he's huh. still around. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Harry Groner, I feel like he's one of those working actors that pops up in lots of shows. Mm hmm. Just got one of those faces. Right away, you could see why people don't necessarily like Tim Albright. <laughs> and yet, I like Harry Groter. Yeah, I and and just to jump ahead, more or less, I, I, I he they haven't come out so strong just to establish that. Oh, this is why you've been hearing what what a jerk this guy is. But then I thought in later scenes they they leveled it out where it was like, okay, this is a guy who's got other stuff going on but initially it was just like oh he's just a jerk and then even the medical explanation of i had i hear everyone's voices was still like well but then i thought he got like a conversation with the data and um with troy they they have both have really good sensible conversation those are two of my favorite parts of the episode where kind of took a not a break but took time to have an actual conversation about things and 
he seemed more like a human, a betazoid, than, <laughs> than just some weird jerk who has powers, you know, because we get plenty of those. So at the beginning, I'm like, yeah, get this guy off my <laughs> shit. See, I never thought he was that bad. I I didn't dislike him at all. I understood he was that grumpy archetype, antisocial. Mm. But yeah, the, we'll talk more about the data scenes as we get to them. But I, I really um, liked that relationship and that bond. Mm-hmm, and yeah. I kind of liked the Troy backstory. I mean, I feel like we get a lot of characters that people know. And yep. it did feel a little convenient that Tr- Troy knew about him and had treated him as a patient. But, you know, it's not a huge universe She's a beta Z. He's a beta Z. Right. The Z, he, the disaster, the Garouche stands or whatever. They really waited to tell us kind of what that was about, which I thought was a little mystery that didn't really intrigue me as probably as much as it should have. I did think it was weird. They threw around casually. Yeah. He's an ESP prodigy. Okay. So ESP is like a thing now that you guys respect in the 24th century. Yeah. I thought maybe that was just thrown in. So we television viewers could understand what they meant, but I feel like we know what, We've been around Troy for two seasons. We know what this is. But she's only an empath. He's a telepath. Oh, that's she's only half beta that's set. True. That's true. Well, but I guess I think we get the concept, but I think that just made it easier. I thought that first meeting, and I rag on the exposition in, in, on here a lot, there was a, bad, there was a bad exposition, and then they get in that meeting, but they're all talking about, well, here's what the mission is and blah, blah, blah. And I thought that was a really good exposition meeting uh, for once. I thought it, you know, it set up some character stakes and and told us what we were in for. Here's my question, and I know the answer already, but I'll just let, I'll have you guys answer. He's reading everyone's mind. Why isn't he just answering them that way? I thought that he was really well done. I thought his portrayal was really good. I thought that the way that they wrote him and the way that he acted it out was quite good. I I find it relatable in the sense of I've had I've had conversations where I know what the other person is going to say as they're starting to say it, and you, you can't. He's been doing this his entire life. He he can't just cut cut them cut everybody off and do this, especially in a room full of people, because he, he's come to understand that you have to let these things play out a certain way, so that it, to prevent uh, to prevent further confusion from happening and just having it keep spiraling out. So it's just God, just come on, guys, stop wasting. All right, I know what you're going to say. Let me do this. Oh. It's just that kind of, but you can't, and it's just yeah. Anyway. Is this what happens in that movie, What Women Want? Is that what happens <laughs> to Mel Gibson? He basically. Basically. <laughs> it's pretty much that. they ripped Tin Man off. <laughs> Starfleet named it Tin Man, which I thought seemed weird. It's not mm-hmm. like it was made out of tin or anything. And we didn't get anything about it not having a heart. So I don't know why they called it Tin Man. And I, I read into that day because I wrote down, is this an Oz reference? And I felt strong it was. So... The guys that wrote the script had written a book in the 70s called Tin Woodman, Tin Woodman, Tin Woodman, which was specifically that he needed in that. And that story was very similar to this, where and it, it, the, the, the entity needed to find a heart. So that's why they mm. called it. So it wasn't it was an Oz reference. And maybe their book, it works better because I didn't I was trying to make that connection. I'm like, this has to be an Oz thing, Tin Man. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, why else would they call it that? But the other interesting thing was, I, I read a little bit more of the reading. So Bailey and Bischoff, uh, Dennis Russell Bailey and David Bischoff, wrote the, the short story, actually. Uh, got nominated for a Nebula Award in 1977, which makes me want to go read it. I, I should find it. But they were inspired to pitch for Next Generation due to their combined dislike of the first five minutes of the second season episode, Marriage and Snare. <laughs> <Which cracked me. laughs> so, and now I'm like, I want to go back and find that. And I, I just went back and looked at the synopsis, and it was, that's the one where... Picard has to go get surgery. I think he and Wesley go to Starbase. Mm-hmm. And then it's the, the the pack lids or whatever. But I can't remember what the first five minutes are. But that's hilarious to me. They're like, we can do better than this. And we're never the award nominees. So I thought I thought that was funny. So I'm not sure if they did better, but I, I they did get a second episode. They wrote First Contact next season. Not the movie oh, okay. First Contact, right. but the episode First Contact. They were invited back to write another episode. But well, if you well, look at 
De- David Bischoff, this is really all that's on his IMDb, oh. other than writing for a 80, 1980s cartoon called Dinosaurs. But if you look at Dennis Bailey's IMDb, it's a lot of Star Trek fan fiction. He's a writer for Starship oh, wow. Farragut. He did visual effects for Dreadnought Dominion and art department for Star Trek Eagle. And these are all fan made Star Trek stuff. So it felt like after this, I guess he just made more Star Trek that wasn't official. So I guess that the heart was just that he didn't have a crew and he needed that. The crew was the heartbeat within him. I yes, think so. Too. That's what that's. The, that's that's a stretch. It, I really? think it is too. Yeah. It's, no, it it's, it's yeah. the ho- the hollowness and the not having to well, care for. I will say that this also made me think of the lyric to the America song, Tin Man. Oz never did give nothing to the Tin Man that he didn't, didn't already have. So I agree that in this instance, there's that too. Albrin never gave nothing to the Tin Man that he did, <laughs> didn't already have. I mean, Tam gave him himself. That's true. Isn't it the same ending as Star Trek The Motion Picture? Sort of. I, I was interested by the uh, revelation that Beta Zeds get their telepathy at puberty, which I'm torn about because, yes, I get like, okay, that must make it easier as children that they don't have to deal with all that stuff. But at the same time, it's like, isn't puberty hard enough without adding telepathy on top <laughs> of it? <laughs> like your body's changing. You're starting to have hormones. And now you can hear what those other people think of you. Yeah. That doesn't oh, seem God. like a good idea. Which, which is worse, making up the terrible things you think they're saying or hearing the actual terrible things they're saying? About I think you. hearing. Well, I think so too. Well, I don't well, know. I feel like there's been smart people have made a point that, Really, what would hurt is that they're not thinking of you at all. That's right. <laughs> and that's the more likely outcome. Yeah, you're right. Well, you're right. But when would be a good time to get that power? Never. At what point? Yeah. I mean, what point in your life would there be a, a Never, convenient but, time to know, to know those sorts of things? Never, poker. but I feel like puberty is, <laughs> puberty is a particularly bad time. Yeah, yeah. Maybe on your deathbed. That'd be a good time to get it. Beta, beta zoids probably can't go into casino. Yeah, or at, ethically, they shouldn't, but that doesn't stop some of them. At least <laughs> all, and I wrote they, down, I think I said this right. You can't BS a beta zoid. I mean, this casino is probably higher dealers and stuff that aren't, uh, they, like you yeah. can't read their minds. They're like data. But uh, go, going back to Tam in particular, as I said, I, I like the way they were, they were playing it. We, we, we've seen uh, Deanna's mother come onto the ship before, and it's not like she's overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. It's uh, this This guy has just, constant everybody on the yeah. ship in his head headaches and just to, to uh, a demonstration with like the different power level i guess mm-hmm. i did think it was odd though that they made mention that he likes to isolate himself from quote other humans he's not human so what did he mean humanoids yes I, he i think eventually he even did say humanoid yeah. but it's uh, that's just one of those i think sl- slips of the script <laughs> yeah that or wasn't to me little, that felt wrong writing they mentioned uh alien race i wrote it down but uh, chandra chandra f- five they have a three-day ritual to say hello I mean, <laughs> that just doesn't seem practical or realistic to me there's it's a probably would have to be structured completely differently if you're willing to give people three days to say hello all the time i think it's more like a, a like a like a welcoming feast or something but not necessarily that's not how he described it. Say, I mean, the implication was saying hello to a new species or something or a new, a new VIP. Not like they say hello to each other every day th- for three days. I don't. I didn't get that implication at all. I so Shan, Chandra five sounded to me for some reason like Shonda Rhimes, and then I my alternate episode was just like I want to see a Shonda Rhimes Star Trek spinoff about a planet like that where they take three days to say hello and they're all soapy and dramatic and whatever. I don't know. Speaking of soapy and dramatic, Keith, you might've noticed this. The stingers in this episode went back to the original series level. <laughs> Didn't catch it. Yeah. There was the, when the Romans first show up, oh. they go to Picard's face like, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> and then okay, yeah. like the very next break, it's the same thing. And I'm like, what is going on here? <laughs> turns out I just, I just saw this, a new composer, debuted on this episode oh so he was really making an impression on me well since you mentioned it i guess i hadn't really thought this through or one of the things that i think works against the episode is that you have just the one romulan there on screen and it seems to be they're there to just be a a convenient uh you know plot point and there's they're a Mm -hmm. very one-dimensional portrayal of them given what we've seen 
seen of them so far in yeah. TNG. It's just like they're there to be like maniacs, essentially. It's like, <laughs> oh my God, there's this thing. There's, a, there's these, you know, here to destroy. Yeah, and, and maybe this is a technical thing, but when they first show up and they shoot the Enterprise, the Enterprise knew they were coming on some level. Yeah. Did they not return fire because they just didn't have the power? I know their shields were down, but I thought their phasers and photon torpedoes were still active and able to go. They talk about an echo that's following them, which is mm -hmm. the exact language in Balance of Terror that the Romulan ship uses about the Enterprise. Mm. They keep calling them an echo. So I thought that was cool. Um, as far as Romulans go, that was about, oh, and then uh, Tin Man does this, but it's another easy starship blow up this episode. That Romulan <laughs> It's gone, which I thought was kind of cool, but I couldn't decide because Tin Man's supposed to be complicated and advanced, but I don't understand why Tam, Tam, Tam couldn't be like, hey, protect yourself, but don't mess up where I am. Yeah. Can you do that? I think Tam's pretty single minded. I don't think he was adding the don't mess think, up where yeah, I am. I think you're right. Oh, well, they I also think, didn't, I mean, Tam and the Tin Man both wanted to kill themselves, right? I mean, we got into yeah. Kevorkian territory here. Yeah. Or, uh, Kevorkian may not be right because it's not really assisted suicide. It's just more like, hey, I'm done with this. I want to be dead. Let me do what I want to do. Well, to that point, that's, I mean, they, they did address that pretty soon afterward. But you, you brought up something that I hadn't really considered, which is that maybe also subconsciously Tam wanted to die, which is why he didn't really instinctively he was just like, protect yourself at all costs. Do it now. Yeah. yeah. Without even thinking this might hurt me too or anything. Uh, yeah. And Jordy mentions it fried unfriable circuits. So that mm. it did some real bad damage there. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also caused something we haven't seen since TOS, which was a lot of bridge flopping. <laughs> nobody nobody saw, was buckled up. They were all over when that thing hit. I saw, uh, I saw one that, that kind of caught my eye. And it was a little, a little comical, maybe, maybe probably unintentionally, but just the shot they showed of Riker and Picard standing up and they just kind of rotated in place a bit when they were spinning, <laughs> when the whole ship was spinning. So uh -huh. it was, they were just kind of, oh, not, yeah, not even yeah, the right, yeah. just kind of. <laughs> well, that was my thought was when the ship got thrown all those millions of kilometers or whatever, that should be the time where everyone was flopping. But everyone just kind of like, well, I'm just kind of kind of lean into this. Yeah. Everyone leaned to the left and now back to the right and we're all fine. <laughs> and I just knew I was like, OK, somebody tell me how far we got through. Somebody tell me how far we got through. Someone, someone tell me how far they got through. Sure enough, <laughs> here's how far we got through. Of course. Uh, yeah. So uh, which I guess makes sense in a way. But I mean, it know. threw them threw them plenty clear from the exploding yeah. star, which is a good distance. Two uh, leagues. Just to. <laughs> Five football jump. fields, something like that. They would say. <laughs> <laughs> Three aircraft carriers. <laughs> Back to, so we talked about already the ESP reference. So the original book was written in the 70s. In that book, it's a young psychic boy. So a young psychic boy in 1979 would have been said to have ESP. So I feel like that's mm. something that just got dragged over. I know this is only 11 years later, but that's part Yeah, of it. you're probably right. I felt like the danger was too much like there's a star that could explode and there's romulans and we've been highly damaged like it just seemed like and there's a crazy back ship off a little bit yeah sure <laughs> it just it felt like too much i yeah the whole time i kept thinking how about you guys just pull back a little let's just pull back a little just to be safe <laughs> just to be safe you know let the romulans get close let them get blown up because they don't care and i thought it, I, i'd like the thing where they're like we know being first isn't necessarily the best thing. isn't a big deal. Mm -hmm. You know, being the first one to do something that matters, just get, get in there first. Who cares? Yeah. And I, I thought like that, that was, that was a good line. I think that was Tam that said that. No, it was, it was Picard, uh, Picard scolding, was scolding Tam for wanting to the get other way there. So, okay. yeah. Yes, you're right. Engineering oh, right. was super dark in this episode, mm. like around the warp core. I felt like darker than usual. I mean, the rest of the ship is so bright. Obviously, in TOS, the engine room was very bright. And when Jordy went back out to where the island, like the kitchen island is, in the middle of that engineering <laughs> yeah, hallway yeah. thing, <laughs> it was bright. But around the warp core, I know it's usually a little dimmer, but it was just so dark. I don't know. It felt weird to me. Yeah. Somebody else was doing the lighting this week. And at first, I was like, well, he's blind, so he doesn't need light. But there right. were a bunch of other crewmen working down there, too. So he, I wonder he if he, he blinded them as well. <laughs> He only hires blind people to work yeah. in engineering. <laughs> 
Dana and Tam talk about humanity. I really enjoyed that. I mean, we already kind of mentioned that we enjoyed their relationship, but are that conversation of somebody that's in humanity, almost extreme, too much humanity coming at him versus the person who's completely separate from humanity. They're two ends of the, the spectrum. I thought that was interesting perspective. I guess it's a matter of perspective, but I think it was interesting. <laughs> well, so one of the things I love about one of those scenes, and this is, uh, in my opinion, a good show, not tell thing. Mm-hmm. Data simply, simply being off at his own station, which he explained was there because he had it tuned specifically to be more efficient mm-hmm. in his quarters. Because, yeah. Because, yeah, because if he was at a regular station, it is like that, that impatience I was talking about that he would, He'd be able to relate to, you know, having mm. to wait for these things to come through, mm. and you know, I can handle more than this. Just let's go. That's good. Yeah, yeah. I really, yeah. I thought that was one of the best conversations in it. Not even sci-fi concepts, just so concepts in Star Trek, Apoth, whatever non-canon <laughs> stuff. They talk. They've talked about for a long time that all the bridge stations are probably configurable, so you don't necessarily have to have the helmsman up front. Like uh-huh. you could all when you turn on those stations, they're meant to be that that's what the designers said when they art design the place that they're modular and they can create them. But I will say in Star Trek discovery, they actually talk about that. And we see a crewman that's like, Oh, oh I've set it up this way. Cause this is the way I like to use it. I know that's not how everybody likes to use it. So eventually that becomes fully part of the canon they discuss, but the, the station should be at this point as well. I forgot that I'd wanted when I when I thought of that I'd wanted to bring up the point that you've made before, Jamie. The the mm-hmm. whole thing about, but I thought it was like you're just being theoretical, like the idea of the oh you could possibly do blah blah. No, blah, but, huh. no, that was purposeful design of the people that do the art de- in the art department that think way too much about the stations, and mm-hmm. unfortunately the writers never really followed oh. through until like now in Discovery. <laughs> but yeah, that was always part of the idea, hmm. which makes sense in my opinion. The Tin Man's race, there were once million of millions of them, but now he's been alone for millennia. That uh I don't know. I, I feel like that's really, really sad. <laughs> if he's yeah. the last one nah. of a big race. Yeah, Keith's like, whatever. Sorry, I, I, need, I need to turn on my virtual background so you can see me doing this so so hand. <laughs> but it's uh, there we <laughs> just kind of uh, I don't know uh, that that impact <laughs> of that story to me, it, it, it hit kind of hard. I felt really, really no, sad that's, for it. That is good. And it only exacerbated it when we found out that the reason it had rooms is because it used to have a crew that lived with it symbiotically. It's almost like an opposite of a trill because the trill, the symbiote's inside the human host, but the Tin Man, that's an alien race in Star Trek. We we haven't got to the trill yet, have we? We're going to get to them a lot. It's a symbiote that lives inside the human host, whereas the Tin Man has human hosts that live inside the symbiote. Yeah. Yeah. It's an anti-trill. When they brought up the idea of that being a living starship, I thought of Lex. Uh, that, that was, that's yeah, it's, it's, that's a little obscure. It's hard to it's hard to gauge how many people would would have been into that or not. Mm-hmm. And also Farscape, which yeah, probably, never saw it. It's yeah. around that same time. Yeah, yeah, interesting. But yeah, they they both had living ships in them to, that worked in, in slightly different ways. Kind of like the Millennium Falcon. Right, Millennium Falcon. <laughs> yeah, right. Star Wars reference. Was, that's right. <laughs> Or in this season, start the Starship Discovery, but we'll get to that hmm. in a long time. <laughs> Eventually, we will discover that. When Data comes that was back, awful. I'm sorry. <laughs> maybe I'm getting ahead, but when he comes back and like, well, what happened? He's like, difficult to explain. Could you try? Yeah, I was try just a little bit. I, I, was, I know we're at the end of the episode, but come on. It felt like they were trying to do a data death fake out, but I did not feel scared for Data for even a second. I no. felt the same way. Yep. And not just because I knew he'd be in future episodes, but also because that's not how he's going to die. It, it seemed odd the way they kept drawing that out. Mm-hmm. I mean, eventually we got to the, the, the great sort of poetic or, you know, data waxing poetic with Troy. About data saying he realized he belongs on the internet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's great. But it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just it, it seemed to me like he would have great data, whatever. He, he, he would have come back and immediately just describe the events as we saw them. And yeah. that would have been sufficient explanation for people to put it together rather than him trying to go well here's that's i mean that's not consistent with what we usually see him do in those situations yeah 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 we know you belong here but what happened um, with, the, <laughs> yeah. with the tin man the whole reason we came all the way out here 23 parsecs past where we've ever gone got into the romulans specifically for this stupid ship and now you're not even telling us what happened with it 
So yeah. we even brought this guy, this expert, and now he's gone too. What happened? I mean, so, I, why can't you just said he touched it and a chair popped up out of the floor? All <laughs> kinds of things like that. That was like, I'd be like that would have been like, oh, wow, really? I mean, that like, was in his log later. <laughs> as much as I love the data Tam relationship, it felt like it was doing more for Tam than it was for data. So for data to, to use that as a catalyst for him feeling accepted felt weird and unearned mm. to me. Mm. Yeah. Also, I assume by data survival, that means Tam and the Tin Man didn't die. They also escaped. Probably. Well, yeah, I was because now I they lost. have purpose with each That's other. That's a good point. You know, I, I guess I'd sort of assumed that, they, that none of them were going to be in danger because it, it seems like a good happy ending. They could just drop them off somewhere. Yeah. But at the same time, it's not like they, they showed them coming up. They could have just right. sent Team him data away and, and yeah. just died together. They, but, they didn't ever specify either. Maybe that's why he was being so vague. But, we'll find out so, in the season six episode, Tin Man 2. No, I'm kidding. No. Do, so do it's an think, episode of Star Trek Picard. No, I'm kidding again. <laughs> do we think they finished their suicide pact or do we think they merged to become a new being that was like, okay, I'll stick around? Yeah, I think they want to stick around now that they're not alone anymore. Okay. I, I really enjoyed the discussion about Tam's motives being trustworthy, but his judgment not being. Yes. I, I thought that was a nice nuanced distinction to make. Yep. O'Brien had such a tiny cameo. It made me sad yeah. that we got of him. <laughs> it was so weird. They so could have just used that same like footage to put him in last week's episode when mm-hmm. they needed to do the transporter thing, right? Yeah. He, he was off filming Marvel movies and... Just Tam, when he's in Tin Man, says, I know everything now. And all I could think about was that episode of Extras we watched. Oh, <laughs> I've seen everything. I, I, you're may, you were making, uh, making me think of something else. I can't, can't put my finger on, but that is that's a great one, too. <laughs> I wanted Tin Man to be like, I've seen everything. <laughs> and then just rip Tam's clothes off. Uh, <laughs> actually, let's talk about fashion. I want to talk about Tam's clothes. Fashion. That is one my one fashion note as well. But you go ahead. I really like his clothes. I would wear that outfit <laughs> if I was in better shape. Um, I like his sweater with the belt and the. I would not like to wear the black contacts that they gave him that they always have the Beta Zeds wear, uh, like mm. Troy wears and Loxana mm. wears. But I liked his his outfit a lot. Although I did wonder if his pants were made out of Vorgon face, because they had as many uh, folds of them as the Vorgon faces did last week. He, I thought for a little while, and then, yeah, when I look closer, it looked more like those guys. I thought he was wearing Zubaz pants. Do you guys mm-hmm. remember those? The name I can't place, uh, like parachute they were, or something? or They were big with sports merchandise in the early 90s, and essentially they were just sweatpants or pants that were in like a zebra fashion, but of your favorite oh, team. Oh, weird. So, I, I'm yeah. looking, at, looking at some of the images right now. I was like... But yeah, I like green, so I like that. I like... He looked like Robin Hood or Peter Pan. Oh my God. So I, bit. And it's a stupid note, but it's when uh, data says he found what he was looking for. I was like, that's a completely <laughs> different song. That's a completely different song that I'm used to, <laughs> which still didn't answer anything. Right. But I don't, I just don't understand why data was being so vague and poetic about a lot of the stuff. And uh, I can see the substitute helmsman just being like, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know. What are you talking about? What do you mean he found what he's looking for? I don't know what you're talking about. The woman in Data's seat in the final scenes mm-hmm. just looked terrified the entire yes. time. Yeah. What was up with that? The ensign or whoever next to next to Wesley or whoever. Yeah, was yeah. yeah. yeah I think she was, was it like, her first time acting, and she was intimidated by being on stage with Patrick Stewart or something. I thought again. I thought she was like the sub for the day. Like this is your big day. It's like we're gonna get killed by Robins. We're gonna get killed by this Tin Man thing. We're gonna get killed by the Supernova. You kind of like you reference earlier, Jimmy. Like she's like. How many things are going to kill us? This is my first day. This is my first day. I hadn't noticed that, but I think that's awesome, actually. That seems like, that seems like something that should happen. You but I did. That I, I noticed that, too, Jimmy. Her reaction was a lot more like, oh, my God. Like, her <laughs> eyes were welling up, which is good acting. because They were welling up. But, and everyone else was just like, yeah, it's just another day on the Enterprise. <laughs> to me, it didn't feel like good acting. It felt like the actress herself was scared. <laughs> <laughs> or didn't know how to act. I mean, see, it's believable. You, you really believed that that person was scared. So. Yeah, no, I, I didn't think it fit with the person sitting in that station. That's why mm-hmm. she's not there all the time. Maybe, oh. maybe, 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 maybe there's just like the again. off shift. Maybe she was being trained by Wesley that that shift, and just oh my god, who needs? <laughs> nobody needs to be trained by Wesley. <laughs> the boy, <sighs> the boy. This episode was directed by Robert Shearer 
who directed 11 episodes of DS9. He looks like he mostly does like big data episodes, like he did The Measure of a Man. Hmm. He also will direct one episode of DS9 and one episode of Voyager. This was his fifth episode he directed, so we've mentioned him before. Steven, do you have an alternate episode? Yeah, mine is The Tin Man Goes Back to Its Home Planet Seeking Its Creator. And it, if it doesn't get the right message, it will destroy its home planet. <laughs> oh, no. A.K.A. Star Trek The Motion Picture. Uh, yeah. That is my alternate episode. <laughs> get away from the supernova. It, it doesn't have so much a suicide pact as a murder suicide pact with Ugh. its home planet. Yeah, that's my alternate episode. <laughs> yeah, it's darker than engineering. That's <laughs> <laughs> Just because of Tam going back into the conference room to confront Riker, or at least to answer, to answer his thoughts, I just put in, with an exclamation point, Billy Boy. I just <laughs> love that when he... Oh, yeah. Okay, let's rank it then. Wesley, scale of 1 to 10, how annoying was he? I was fine with him. I gave him a 1. Well, I'm going to give him a 1 unless he was training that girl, and then he <laughs> doesn't deserve a 1. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my, my nod meant that I, I also agree is, that it's a one. Okay. Who was your annoyance? I know he kind of came around, but Tam was still my annoying. Yeah. Okay. And Picard said it. Oh, wait, that was last week. A <laughs> <laughs> couple of options here, but I actually I'm going to go with the Romulan. Yeah, that's a good one, too. That's who I'm going with as well, Keith. Yeah. You almost uh, talked me into choosing data because of that ending. Just the. <laughs> yeah. It's like, come, just come on. What do you? <laughs> yeah. Crush of Star Trek. Anybody want to switch their crush to Tin Man? Uh, I'm going to stick with Mrs. Abgar. Mrs. What, what, Abgar. what about the, what about the frightened uh, helmsman? The frightened Ensign? Yeah. yeah. Nah. No, I'm definitely <laughs> not picking her. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I thought you were going to go with her for your annoyance. Honestly. Oh, oh, yes, I did too. I did too. No, I mean, she was annoying, but not as annoying as the Romulans. Keith, are you switching your crush to the Tin Man? I am not. Okay. That's all I need to know there. Ranking the episode there at the top. <laughs> the, the top of the low middle. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just start with last week's episode, Captain's Holiday. Better or worse? It's tough the- part, I'd say Captain's Holiday was, was better. It was just, I enjoyed it more. Yeah. yeah, that's what it really comes down to. It's it's harder for me than it should be, I guess, to, simply because, of as I said, I... I I enjoyed the the Tam performance. I like the way mm-hmm. I like the way it was portrayed, and yeah. I like some of the stuff that came out of the interaction with the data in the ship. But there were obviously things that pulled away from the, that. Mm-hmm. Holiday is probably better. Yeah, I think it's easily better. Below that is Allegiance. So Tin Man had some really good scenes and interesting moments mm-hmm. or thoughts in it, but I also found the episode super boring, which makes me want to rank it low. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you're saying that that this that Allegiance was better. Yeah, I've got the recency bias creeping in. It's hard to tell. So, what is what's below Allegiance? The enemy, which is your enemy mine, Romulan mm. uh, Jordy, trapped on the planet. I'm surprised it's that low. Yeah, the enemy is number twelve of nineteen so far. No so defector. I guess that's why we're near the bottom because we don't <laughs> like any of these. I mean, we're <laughs> wow. actually, yeah. I mean, I, I think we're I in the range. I think probably. the enemy and Tin Man are pretty comparable, personally. Yeah, I. The, conver- the the concepts in this are more interesting than those. The the episode itself wasn't super exciting. Oh, below the enemy is the survivors. And I think survivors is better than this. That was the X bridges. They were left oh, alone in the house. Yeah. I'm surprised. They, I'm, it's amazing how low some of these have gotten. Yeah, the survivors. I would bump up. The survivors is another one. I mean, like I just like the 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 ending was. Yeah. Great. I think I'd put it below Survivors, but probably not go any lower than that. What's the next one down? We, we Instance of Command. Ugh. <laughs> I mean, I just, None I just, of these were bad episodes. They just yeah. weren't as good as... Right, no. This, uh, this, is, this is at least better yeah. than that, I think. I think so, too. Yeah, I think that's fair. But I would put it just above Instance of Command, below Survivors. Yeah, I think it's a good spot. Keith's sort of nodding. Yeah, I'm... I'm yeah, I'm, I'm not feeling strong enough to, to really argue, but I, I, yeah, I feel like it's better than that, but it, it's certainly in the, in the right place ish. So, okay. Yeah. Next week we are watching hollow pursuits, 
which is uh, a shy member of the Enterprise crew becomes addicted to the holodeck where relationships are easier than in real life. Oh my God. When his knowledge is needed in engineering. And we finally get to meet Reginald Barclay. Who I thought seats. was in this series a lot more than he is. I'm looking and he's only in five episodes, huh. one a year for the rest of the series, which I mean, maybe because he was in Star Trek First Contact, he was in one of the films. I guess I had a bigger thought of him. And he's in six episodes of Voyager. So he ended up being in Voyager more than yeah. Next Gen. <laughs> Which is again Hollow, surprised me. I thought he was in more episodes of Next Gen, but is Hollow Pursuit spelled H O L O? No, but they that <laughs> oh my god missed opportunity. Oh, I don't know if you'll like Barclay or not, Stephen. You might find him really annoying, but he is played by the great Dwight Schultz from the original A Team. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. He's a um, polarizing character, but I like him. Same. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna hop a trip back in time with the Vorgons from last week. Uh-huh. And tell them to change the title to H O L O Pursuit. <laughs> that sounds like a good idea. And then next week, we'll have the same uh, similar conversation. We won't even have this conversation. We're like, oh yeah, it's H O L O. Ha ha ha! Holiday. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> well, I'm I'm really looking forward to Hollow Pursuits now that I know it's the Barclay episode. Uh, you guys got you got me more interested. All right. And um, gotta see this guy. Well, until then. Live long. Take you t- already three- know what I you know what I'm thinking already. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say and, and take three days just to say hello. Oh <laughs> <laughs> and prosper. Wait, 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 we're not done yet. Oh, Keith already <laughs> left. Darn. Uh, uh, Steven and I are sticking around because we read Tin Woodman. Yeah. The book that this story loosely was based on. Mm-hmm. Steven. What was your first impression of the book? I discussed my geek bona fides when I was in junior high or elementary school and junior high many times out here getting track. And so, you know, one of my goals is to read all the, the entire science fiction section at the Enon Library, Enon, Ohio Library. So this reminded me of a lot of the, the books I would have read or stories I would have read then. It was, you know, and I, you know, again, some of it's but I love that 70s feel we've talked about, you know, 70, 70s sci-fi is like, recognizing stuff getting old, but still futuristic. And I, it, it kind of put me in that zone, you know? And I think one of the blurbs I read was like, it's part this and part this and part Star Trek was like, which makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, I really enjoyed it. I was surprised how much it stayed on the ship because I thought it'd be more about the Tin Woodman. And, you know, with the actual episode, a lot of it ended up, I felt like more of it was about the, about Tin Woodman. And about the the Div character, Div Hall Thor is the character in Tin Woodman. Not wasn't the same in uh, the episode, obviously. But it makes sense that when they went to do the future episode, they're like, you know what? These guys already have the starship part down, so we can get more into this other stuff. Whereas back then, when they wrote it, it's like, no, nah, we can go into this other world. And it was so it was it was it wasn't necessarily dystopian, but it was kind of a maybe things aren't going to be so awesome because the Starfleet or whatever, I can't think of the name, the Galactic Command mm-hmm. is not, you know, the more you get into the, as the book develops, the, the or novella, short story, uh, the more you're like, oh, these guys may not be the good guys, but... Uh, it was almost 200 pages. I consider that a yeah, full novel. It's I a short too. novel, but I, I'd yeah. say it's a full novel. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. The universe that it's set in is very, very different. Mm-hmm. Uh, and obviously they took just a small part of the book yeah. And put it in the Star Trek episode. So the majority of the book isn't about what's in the episode. Right. It's the ship following the Tin Woodman. Yeah. Uh, and the culture and everything around that. Yeah. I dug it. Honestly, mm-hmm. I am kind of glad they didn't spend more time on the Tin Woodman. Honestly, mm-hmm. I found Tin Man, as we just talked about, a bit boring. And the book wasn't boring. It was a little slow start, I thought. Yeah. But once it got going, I was really into it. it. You're right. It reminded me of older sci-fi novels I've read. It reminded me a little bit in tone and some of the concepts in it of Brave New World, which mm-hmm. was published in the 30s. So much older yeah. than this. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I mean, not as high quality as Brave New World, perhaps. Sure. But there are some similarities in the way society developed uh, in the two. Although Brave New World, they stayed confined to Earth because it was all entertainment. In this, they got set off on ships, but they still tried to distract and keep you focused on unnecessary things yeah. so that you didn't actually take a real look at life and buck the system. Right. They, and those that bucked the system were the bad, were the bad guys, but they were our heroes that the story right. was told through. Yeah. Mutiny on the bounty was another one 
him. I could see that through in there, which makes sense. I didn't see the mutiny coming, but for some reason, that part was very exciting. There's yeah, a love story in it. Yeah, there is. Uh, there's that. I thought, you know, like I said, I thought I'd go with the Div Hallthor guy from the beginning. I think they say there's a thousand people or several thousand people on this ship. A lot of people, yeah. yeah Bigger than the Enterprise cool. D for sure. Yeah, and then the ending with the the Tin Woodman and all that stuff kind of points towards a. It is actually a very Star Trek kind of Star Trek slash two thousand one kind of ending. Like these people are like another level. Yeah, and the people essentially are like. You know what? You guys aren't ready. Even even uh, the one of the talents, as they call him, uh, Mora Elbrook, they're like, you know what? You're not quite ready for this. This might be too much for you. Go back. But they don't destroy him. They're not like, we must destroy you. They're just like, you know what? We'll check back in on you in a while. Yeah. Then come on through and, and, and come on through here. So the ending was written very trippy to me, which I yes, oh, it very, was one of yeah. those things where it almost felt like they didn't quite know how to tie it up. So they're going to mm-hmm. try to go into some weird esoteric concepts. Well, and you know, you get into that thing, you know, cause you know, it's even better. Keith's not here. Cause you know, I mean, we're, nobody loves a spoiler, but it's like, I have 14 pages left of this and we're doing this right now. What is going to happen? And then, yeah, I, I, that's very much like, and again, that go, to me, in my head go points towards like a 2001, like, you know what? You tell us what it means to you. You figure that out. And that's what the ending is, which yeah. is kind of what I did. So, um, yeah. but I thought, but I saw, I liked that idea of the, the, the captain was the bad guy, not the, and again, Mutant on the Valley, that's an easy reference, mm-hmm. but you know, we're so used to Kirk and Picard. Those guys are the heroes and this guy was not. And then, yeah. It seemed like I had a hard time finding this book. It seemed like it might be out of print. Uh, the copy I ended up ordering, and I think I got through Amazon though, was like a library copy that had been discarded from a library. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, I got the I got a paperback version, which definitely looked just like the. And I have a few of my paperbacks from back then, but it looked very much like it. And by the time I was done reading it, it looked even more worn. <laughs> uh, so that was fun. Uh, it was a quick yeah. read. I read it in about three yeah. hours or so, I think. Yeah, it, it became my end of the night book. So I would mm-hmm. read 10, 15 pages at the end of the night and then try and find a good stopping spot. Yeah, I enjoyed it a lot. Like I said, it took me back to, you know, uh, a lot of the, the sci-fi from those days and obviously having kind of a Star Trek element, which. Did you like it more or less than the episode we just talked about, Tin Man? Probably just for the aspect of reading and, you know, now I'm getting into the book versus Mm-hmm. versus the other thing it made me appreciate the episode more the the main character who i'm annoyed with in the show yeah if 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 we'd been able to have more of a fleshed out thing like where div like div harthor and and more were coming from it's like we get in their inner thoughts it's like okay i dig where they're coming from mm-hmm. and it was hard i know in episodic television an hour long it's hard to get all that yeah. across so to me he was annoying although we did we did find ways to be uh, have empathy for him but I thought, I thought these guys were almost interesting. Although I guess a guy being just like, get me out of here, <laughs> which I guess Div kind of was too. But Div was more like, I found my home. Whereas yeah. I feel like in the episode, the guy did find his home, but he was just like, I got to get away from all these, these other people. One other thing that I thought was rang true. And I, you know, now in, in the seventies and there was, you know, these talents were, and this is very Spielbergian for whatever, you know, Close Encounters, ET, these things are different. Let's kill them. Let's stop them from, from doing bad things to us. You know, mm-hmm. if they get, they're weird. They're different. They have powers. We have to kill them. We have to stop yeah. them. And oh, the other thing, yeah, that reminds me. You know, they talk about early on. One of the things is you have to have one of these talents on every ship. And mm-hmm. I'm like, that makes total sense for TNG because it, sure. you know, uh, Deanna is a very, very. That's kind of her role. Uh, so I thought that was really interesting too. And I wondered how much, or if, if, if I think I thought of two things, one was, did anybody involved in, in, in the developing Deanna early on ever read this book? Probably not. But I also may, it makes me think that that's why those two guys were watching are like, we can do better than this, which is yeah. why they wrote the episode. And maybe like, we already did a bunch of this stuff. I do think I like the book better than the episode Tin Man, mm-hmm. but I like most Next Gen episodes better than this. I would agree. I book, maybe I agree. Like I like Next Gen as a world better than this world. I agree. This was yeah. a great world for a book. I don't think it would be a world I want to spend seven seasons in. I agree. Yeah, I so, think it would be tough because I, yeah. 
I don't know where. I wouldn't want to be on that ship for seven seasons. You couldn't be. There's no yeah. way that ship survives another seven seasons. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And I don't know if I want to follow Mora or any of that stuff. I mean, yeah. and I feel like, the, I guess if you were going to make it an anthology where every week you looked at a different person, because I when they went with this guy or that guy, I was like, oh, this is interesting. But yeah, I, I'm with you. I don't. I, I feel know. like that would dilute it. I f- yeah. uh, just my opinion. I think this was the perfect length for this story. And yes. I didn't, it did not leave me wanting more. I agree. Yeah. I, not I agree. in a bad way. Like I liked it. Right. I just, okay. The yep. story's done. I'm good. Yeah, uh, I agree. Yeah. I was not looking for Tin Woodman. T- no. Tin Woodman too. More Woodmaning. Or more stories about the Pegasus. Yeah. I yeah. Either. No, no, no. This is just right. Yeah. Well, thanks for talking the book with me. And yeah. we'll be back next week with another episode of Trekked. Until then, live long. And prosper. It's All Been Done presents. Who's got the time?